We have a wonderful collection of uh, speakers today, so thank you all for being here. We're starting off with Sarah Dooley, who is our Head of Food at Soil Association Scotland and runs the Food for Life Scotland programme. And we have Jane Jones, National Chair of Assist and also Commercial Manager at Argyll and Peak Council, along with Scott MacDonald, who is from um, Breckenridge, a local authority supplier. Then we have Lorraine Ford from uh, East Lothian Council, the Senior Officer in Facilities Management, with Ken Wright from George Anderson, one of their um, suppliers. Oh, Lucy, you uh, muted yourself. How did that happen? How long have I been on mute for? Not long, no okay. way. <laughs> did I get, did you hear the speakers? Up until 10. Okay, uh, wonderful. So, yep, Ken from George Anderson and Sons and then Gillian Cameron from the Supplier Development Programme. So thank you all for being with us today and I will hand over to Sarah. Great, thank you Lucy. Hi everyone, hopefully you can all see and hear me. Um, if not, then um, pop pop in the chat box if you have any any problems. But um, it is it's great to see you all here today, um, and and great to be with you. Um, we uh, are really excited to have everybody everybody joining us, and I'm actually just quite excited to have a few more people and some new faces in my kitchen office today. Um, so yeah, great, great to to be hol holding this event, and we're we're just kind of delighted to be hosting uh, this event today and to be starting this conversation. Um, so I know there's still uh, there's still a few people joining, um, but hopefully um, you can you can kind of catch up with with where we are. And if you if you're just joining, then feel free to post your name and organisation in the chat box, um, so we can can see see who's with us today. Um, but I'll, I'll continue just to let you know a little bit of background. Um, some of you I know will be quite familiar with Food for Life Scotland, um, but for those of you who aren't, I'm just going to give a quick introduction. Um, so as, as Lucy mentioned, my name's Sarah. I'm the Head of Food at Soil Association Scotland and I manage the, the Food for Life Scotland programme. Um, and we're a programme that is funded by the Scottish Government that has a mission to make good food the easy choice for everyone and we're currently looking at that through supporting local authorities with their school meal service. So at, at Food for Life we have a definition of good food that um, goes beyond just calories on the plate and we um, to the wider benefits that food can have and for us good food is food that's good for the environment, it's food that's good for the health and it's food that's good for the economy. And through our Food for Life third tier award scheme and standards, which some of you may or may not be familiar with, we use that scheme to support local authorities to source and serve more of that kind of food. And in terms of encouraging local sourcing, which is obviously the focus for today, um, the Food for Life third tier award rewards local authority spend on Scottish food um, and things like using seasonal produce, displaying food provenance information are all important requirements of the award. Currently, 14 of Scotland's local authorities hold a Food for Life served here award and between them they serve um, almost 20 million school meals, certified school meals every year. Um, and, and that's just a bit of background to the award itself, but then within that and within our funding, Food for Life can offer a bespoke support service and can help facilitate projects which increase the amount of Scottish produce procured for school meals, which I, I know lots of you here will be aware already has, has multiple benefits from reinvesting in the local community to connecting, reconnecting children to their food, to contributing to a greener environment and, and much more besides. Um, working with local authorities, industry partners and suppliers in Scotland for several years now and we've supported local sourcing and supply chain projects of lots of different shapes and sizes and within that with varying successes and lots of lots of learning which is one of the things that we're kind of excited to be sharing and kind of starting um, starting to do more of today. Um, so with, with that kind of background um, and but there's there's also um, 
no doubt that one of the one of the greatest kind of endorsements for local sourcing has come recently as a result of the coronavirus pandemic that we're all still finding ourselves in. Um, and one thing that we did with Food for Life earlier this summer is we compiled a series of case studies which recorded how suppliers responded to the crisis. And we heard from local authorities who had prioritised local food supply during the pandemic. And it was really encouraging to see local suppliers supporting their local authorities to deliver essential services and then vice versa, local authorities supporting their local suppliers to stay afloat and keep trading. Um, so that's the kind of thing that we, we want to see more of, obviously. Um, but that kind of partnership isn't necessarily something that can happen overnight. And we know that public procurement can be complicated, competitive, cost driven, and it might not be the easiest route to market or the most obvious, but we think that the journey is worth undertaking. Um, and that's kind of one of the reasons for putting on this event today. The event is really about starting a conversation, starting that journey. Um, and I, it isn't necessarily going to initiate contracts instantaneously. And we won't necessarily be able to lay out a really clear vision of how and when you could supply your local school. But I think what we're hoping is that it gets us all thinking, <laughs> um, whether you're a supplier or a local authority representative, someone who is already supplying school meals or someone who's never been able to get into it before. I hope what we can do with this event is to start, start that conversation and, and hope that it gets us thinking about what opportunities there might be out there for us now. If perhaps if it's if we can just connect with the right person or ask the right questions. And I think the message from us at Food for Life is that we're here to help facilitate that. Um, so that that's kind of a bit of a background, a bit of a backdrop to, to the event from our perspective. Um, I think I think it's also fair to say that there'll always be lots of different factors at play in public procurement. But one of the things that that means is that there's also lots of different routes, routes to market and to supplying school meals and getting involved with, with local authority contracts. Um, and you'll hear more about this later, but just, just to say briefly that there, there are two main types of contract for school meals. Those that are set up and managed directly by individual local authorities and those that are set up and managed by procurement body Scotland XL. And I think um, Samantha Whitehead from um, Scotland XL is on the on the meeting today and I'll hand over to Sam to do a quick introduction to Scotland XL just after just after this um, if, if she's there. Um, so yeah within those those two kind of broad contracts there's there's a range of different options for getting involved and we've been involved in supporting what we kind of sometimes term as hyper local re really small scale local partnerships um, such as a, a project we're working on um, with a, a market garden on Arran supplying the island schools but there's also options for listing your product with the contracted supplier accessing school meals business in different ways um, without necessarily tendering directly yourself but there's there's as I say there's, there's more on that to come and I think um, the moral of the story really is that there's more than one door open in this in this space. <laughs> so um, I think I think I'm coming to the end of my allotted time slot. Um, so I'm really looking forward to the discussion today and I'd like to echo Lucy in thanking our speakers for taking the time out to share their knowledge and experience. And just to thank you all for turning up and tuning in um, to start this conversation. We're, we're just really excited about where it could lead. Um, so Sam, if you're there, I'll just hand over to you to give a brief introduction. And if not, then just back to, to, to Lucy, I think. Thanks everyone. I'm here, so um, if you can all hear me. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Sam Whitehead and I'm a Senior Procurement Specialist within the Corporate and Education team at Scotland Excel. So I oversee the management of five of our food frameworks, groceries and provisions, frozen foods, fresh and cooked meats and fresh fish, bread and rolls and fruit and veg. Scotland Excel are the centre of procurement expertise for local government sector. We are a leading non-profit shared service funded by Scotland's 32 local authorities. Our services are designed to help members meet the challenges of reducing budgets at a time of growing demand, and that is more crucial now than ever before. 
Scotland XL works to secure best value for customers and improve the efficiency and effectiveness of procurement in Scotland's public sector. Collaborative procurement and shared services have a key role to play in saving money to protect frontline public sector services. A strategic approach to procurement also supports and encourages innovation in service delivery and brings wider economic, environmental and social benefits to communities. With a portfolio of contracts worth 1 billion, Scotland XL delivers savings of around 15 million a year to local authorities and associate members. In fact, over the last 10 years, Scotland XL has saved councils around five pounds for every one pound invested in our operating costs. Further savings have been achieved through rebates and price negotiations, which are delivered through robust supplier and contract management processes. From encouraging employers to pay the living wage to promoting apprenticeships and job creation, our procurement frameworks are designed to realise the wider social and community benefits that public sector procurement can achieve. There are opportunities for companies of all sizes to become suppliers to Scotland XL and the wider public sector. Scotland XL encourages a wide variety of businesses to tender for contracts and around 70% of our suppliers are local small to medium enterprises, which helps secure local employment and economic growth. All of our opportunities are published on Public Contracts Scotland, but if you have any queries after today, I will leave my contact details in the chat facility. Thanks very much. That's great. Thank you, Sam. And thank you so much, Sarah, for um, your introduction as well. So now I would like to pass over to Jane Jones and Scott McDonald. Rukia, our mic was still on mute there before I started. Uh, Apologies. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I do have some slides, so bear with me a wee second till I um, share my screen. Can someone confirm if you can see my slides? Yes. Yeah, that's great. We can see that. Perfect. Well, thanks, everyone. Uh, as, as Lucy said, I'm Jane Jones, uh, Commercial Manager at Argyll and Butte Council. So I'm here largely to have a chat with you today about Argyll and Butte Council's approach from my own experience. Um, but I'm also chair of a system which represents 32 local authorities in Scotland. So before I move on to the local context, I thought I'd put a couple of facts to you by way of that wider context, which I hope might frame some of the um, discussions today. Uh, I have a big ambition and it's to make sure that every child in Scotland receives school meals that are hot, nutritious, tasty, locally produced, sustainable, but within public sector budgets. Food that's good for their health, good for their communities and good for the planet. And I would like to see the same across hospitals, care homes and all other areas of the public sector. Uh, that's not too much to ask for, is it? <laughs> uh, in terms of what our market looks like, our school meal service across Scotland, as um, Sarah said, is run by each of the 32 local authorities and they deliver local school meals to the children and young people in their area. Now, in terms of volume, that is two and a half thousand schools in our communities all over Scotland. And they range in size from large urban secondary schools to the smallest of rural village primary schools. So think about that as a single market, access to two and a half thousand different units. We are serving 350,000 meals each and every day. And if you compare that to other sectors that are perhaps held in, in slightly higher esteem, there are 1,800 hotels in Scotland. There are 94 McDonald's in Scotland and there are 2,500 schools. At the end of September this year, healthcare and education accounted for 43% of all meals eaten outside of the home. Now that is huge and it's obviously largely in relation to the pandemic as well. So we can't take credit for that at all times. But it's still outside the pandemic times, it's still a substantial 26% of all meals. So we're a lucrative market and more so we're a growing one. Free school meal entitlement is increasing, unfortunately, as a result of the pandemic, but that means more and more children needing a hot school lunch every day. And with the rollout of free school meals to all children in early years due to commence, that will increase our provision by an estimated further 25% or another 87,500 meals per day. This is the wee tots in Dallin Tober Primary uh, Early Years Unit in Campbelltown on their very first day of, of free school meals. 
Now, as Sarah said in her introduction, uh, 14 out of the 32 local authorities in Scotland have Soil Association Food for Life accreditation, and that demonstrates they have similar principles to Argel and Butte. But we are seen as a bit of a Cinderella service that we are hard to deal with. Bureaucratic, loads of red tape, and really hard to get into. Now, not all local authorities operate in the same way, but I'm hoping to show you today how, with some willing commitment from everyone, we can build uh, successful local food opportunities. Our Gell and Butte Council is rural. It has a high reliance on the food and drink sector, uh, though we have a high prevalence of micro businesses that tend to cater to the high end of the food and drink industry. 4% of our population is employed in food production versus a Scottish average of 2%. And doing a little bit of research for today's session, I dusted off the Argyll and Butte Economic Forum report, which uh, was written back in 2016. And in that, the main recommendation for the food and drink sector was that processors should consider a greater focus on food service rather than retail multiples, because their volumes are high, but their margins are low. And I actually received some information today from the Isle of Butte, where one in four businesses are food and drink related. So it's a huge part of our culture and a huge part of our communities. Now, 83% of our corporate and education spend is on contract. So there is good sense to be a contracted supplier. And in 2019-20, 67% of our Gillen Butte's procurement spend was with SMEs. So we are not perfect. We're, there is always scope to do more and to do better. So I am speaking today as much from my own desire to increase local provision as I'm speaking about what works well for us. Now, working with local suppliers and producers is not new for us. We've been doing it for many, many years, and we traditionally managed a large number of local contracts in-house, which is the opposite of what Sam described with the Scotland Excel frameworks being in place. Uh, however, that has changed over the years, and we are now mo much more uh, involved in some of the, the national procurement that Scotland Excel does, all of the, the heavy lifting around. A good example, though, of our local work is our Butte pilot project, which is now over 10 years old. We did an intensive project there to increase local provision in the Isle of Butte so that local schools in the care home could make use of local meat, eggs, cheese, milk and other commodities. And we still work with those same suppliers today. We have a sustainable procurement strategy, which clearly focuses on our desire to increase the number of local suppliers we work with. For me, it's a real no-brainer. It's certainly a way of growing or sustaining our local communities by reinvesting in local businesses through public sector food. We can protect those communities and keep jobs in them. That, in turn, keeps schools open, keeps businesses open and keeps communities thriving. If you are interested in knowing more, we don't have time for the detail today. You can see our inclusive growth case study here on the inclusivegrowth.scot website. We are working to deliver opportunities for local suppliers and producers through a variety of ways. Now, I'm going to run through these really quickly, but happy to dive into them in a lot more detail later. We like to use smaller lots for geographical areas. For us, chopping Scotland up into 32 local authorities isn't always the right thing because it still means it's not accessible for a lot of suppliers. So we look at very small geographical lots, including just islands, so that we can engage with real local business. We carry out significant engagement with the market, identifying local suppliers in creative ways. So, for example, in the past, we've worked with environmental to identify registered food businesses, for instance. We also hold supplier engagement events so that we can talk directly to suppliers. And I'm looking forward to Gillian telling us more about the supplier development programme later on in today's session. I think we need to be really clear about the public sector opportunity and what that can mean for suppliers. We supply, we want supply out with peak hospitality times. We're shut in the summer, we're shut at Christmas, we're shut at Easter, but we want the supply the rest of the year. We aren't going anywhere, so that makes us reliable. And we largely pay our bills in time, so we're a good way of regulating cash flow for business, especially at the moment. Something else we are doing is working to simplify tender processes and helping to support businesses through the tender process. Yes, that is something we need to get better at, but something we are trying to do. We use community benefit clauses to make sure we're delivering additional benefits for our communities so that we have that holistic approach to how we do things. 
As Sam said in her update, we are keen to promote the living wage and fair work practices. That for us is critical. But we're also keen where appropriate to use subcontractors where a full award to an SME is not possible. So we're willing to work with the market to deliver as best we can. But it's all about people and it's all about relationships. And while that might be true of most commodities, I think it's even more important when we're talking about food and drink. We want food that's sustainable, healthy and nutritious so that we can make good quality hot meals for our children and young people. And that food will only get like that if people care about what they're doing with it. And that starts at the very beginning of the food chain and ends with empty plates, little or no food waste and, and full bellies. So I'd like to introduce you to one of those critical suppliers for us to Scott McDonald, who I'm hoping might tell you a little bit about his business, as well as the working relationship that he has with the school meal service in Argyll and Butte. Are you there, Scott? Hang on. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. Brilliant, that's good news. Uh, I'll certainly do my best on this one. Here we go. Um, at Breckenridge, we're a fresh produce wholesaler. We supply the whole of the west coast of Scotland, as far down as Campbelltown, up to the Highlands, and over to the west to all the islands. Our main debt was Nobin, ideally his place to serve a Island Butte Council, and any other councils for that matter as well. Anyone to listening, we go everywhere and anywhere. Uh, we started with our Island Butte a number of years ago, doing the local school area at Oban. And due to the success and a good working relationship we built, we managed to expand that contract to do Campbelltown and more recently on to Dunoon as well. So the contract grew over the last five years almost 50%. So this shows one benefit to work with my local authority, but there are many more from our perspective, which I'll see on the slides. Uh, the first one Jane touched on is obviously guaranteed payment, guaranteed volumes, um, with it being government back, but there's a lot more to it than just that. Um, I mean, with your set sales volumes, you you know what pr products you're going to use. You can use that to, along with your other uh, customers, get you set pricing. Um, yeah, it's all about them. And then that brings on to the next point, which is having a mixture of customers, which is a big thing for us, is you can't just have all hotels and restaurants. You need to have the right blend. Uh, again, the Butte Council and the other local authority contracts, they, manage to, they allow you to consolidate your customer base. Um, so you've got your shop. I mean, our business is made up of majority of restaurants and hotels. We've got a section of shops as well, and the other section is the local authority. So that's come to prominent over the last few months, obviously with the hospitality downturn uh, with, with COVID, that the shops and the local authority contract have still been there for us, which has been a big plus. The next one, I think, is probably the most important part of uh, supplying a local authority. It's a bit, it's a bit indirect, but it is uh, the presence in the community. It's, uh, it may not sound that important, but we found it to be a big benefit at Breckenridge. When you go into areas such as Dunoon, Campbelltown, is the allows you to the school contract allows you to sort of give you a backbone to supply other customers. Um, I mean, the catering staff, everyone talks uh, with other people, and it allows you to build relationships in the community. And before we know it, you're supplying not just the schools, you're supplying your hotels, your restaurants in the local area. We've gone from maybe doing a few orders in these areas to maybe 15 or 20 due to the starting off with our local authority contract. So it's a big thing for us. Um, and it opens further doors. Uh, so, yeah, I'll hand you back to Jane now for the next wee bit. Great stuff. Thanks, Scott. I think you're absolutely right. Those wider community benefits and, and opening up markets that you don't know necessarily exist um, are, are unintended consequences, but probably very welcome ones. Yes, definitely. Yep. We are, uh, as a council, in clean, uh, 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 dead keen to also look at availability of specific local products. So for us, it's, it's great to work with suppliers who have got a range of products. Um, but we're also dead keen if there is something local to be able to find a, a way of getting that into our schools too. And one particular success story for us is unfortunately also one that has come to an end. And it was uh, Campbellton Cheese. So our enabler for the delivery of that excellent product to schools up and down Argyll, there was our existing relationship with Breckenridge. 
So we've been working with First Milk for quite some time, trying to get the product, trying to get the right product, but we had no way of distributing it across our schools. And that is where Breckenridge stepped in. So Scott, can you tell us a wee bit about that? Yeah, certainly can. It's a shame it's finished at the moment, the Campbelltown cheese, um, but hopefully uh, the dairy will get going again in Campbelltown. Uh, I know there's a lot of support in the community down there to get it going. Uh, obviously, with the pandemic and such like, it's all kind of ground to halt, but there was a lot of people involved. So, fingers crossed, when it's all over next year, we can have another look at it and get things moving again. But um, when we were doing it, um, it was a fantastic thing because obviously it was a local product and we the main logistic hard part of it was getting the volumes of the cheese and the correct blocks as uh, Jane said earlier on you know again Butte Council has got a lot of big schools and a lot of wee schools so getting small blocks and big blocks and getting the right blocks to the right school was a big problem but we got there um, but and the catering staff loved it because they could obviously put it on their menus um, and uh, we even found other customers used it as well. Uh, it was a big thing we were able to push to hotels and restaurants because everyone likes a Scottish product uh, in Scotland. And uh, so hopefully, fingers crossed, we can get it back. But it shows you the when you're dealing with a local authority, I mean, our main thing was is fruit and veg with the schools. But we were able here to do a bit of product diversification, adding an item to the basket. You're going to the school anyway. It's a block of cheese. It's got three or four pound margin on it. And you know, every little bit helps on to the order to make a wee bit of money off it and at the same time benefit all these other indirect things as well. So yeah, hopefully, fingers crossed, it's coming back. Definitely. <laughs> you sure out, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I think for us, the other benefit of that, Scott, was making use of the vans that are on the road. So it helped to yeah. reduce the miles and it got that extra product in yeah, the van on the road. We, we're going to these places anyway, so you know it's it wasn't as if it was an extra expense either. You know it was just it yeah. was worked, worked in very well. So fingers crossed next year we can try and get it started again. But well, uh, plenty there's plenty of cows down there. It's just a matter of uh, getting some people to make the cheese. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the other thing I wanted to touch on as well, um, and and Sarah alluded to this in our introduction, was the the pandemic response. Now. Through the pandemic, we, I'll be absolutely honest, we were only able to successfully meet the needs of our, um, the food needs of our communities through our local food partnerships. Actually, I think it might be Campbellton Cheese in that picture there. Um, yeah. yeah. Good, good stuff. Nice. Um, and it was those relationships that kept the food going to doorsteps. Now, I don't want to steal any of Scott's thunder, but if ever there was any doubt about what mattered most, it was absolutely that local provision. So yes, we needed to get tins of soup and pasta and things like that to people who had no access to food, weren't able to leave their homes and were, we, and were shielding or, or unable to access food for a large number of reasons. But it was the local aspect, the local food aspect that was so important. So it was our relationships with our local suppliers like Breckenridge and with Blacks of Dunoon that got us through the pandemic. And that enabled our communities to feel supported and cared for. And that is what mattered. Um, not sure if you've seen, seen this, Scott, uh, but here are some of the many, many positive comments that we received about that local food. Oh, no, it's not. That's some of our deliveries going out. Um, but that's some of the comments about the local food. That's not food. my stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that, that shows you how, how people really appreciated it when they were most in need that we were able to give them things that added some value to them. Yeah. You want to tell us a wee bit about your perspective, Scott? Yeah, definitely. I mean, the, I've seen a few of these things coming through um, from Christine, and uh, the one that got me was the one about strawberries. Yeah. Uh, you know, it was uh, the strawberries and the cream, and then they ate that, and you know, it's, it gave some it gave people something to smile about. There's not been a lot to smile about recently, uh, so it was nice. You know, it's something you don't often get uh, in our line of work. Is nice stories kind of coming out of these things. So this, this one about the strawberries and cream was definitely my favourite. But uh, yeah, so during lockdown, um, most of our staff were furloughed uh, initially, and uh, we ran a scaled back operation just for an emergency supply for the local shops uh, with the hospitality sector closing overnight. Um, so the shops benefited a wee bit from getting extra business from the stay at home thing, but it wasn't really it wasn't. It wasn't really. It wasn't enough. The just the shops doing it. This is where the where the local authorities came in. Sort of, sort of April, May of the, the lockdown, and 
came up with the food parcel idea, um, which really took off. Uh, and we, it was um, well, our main part of it was uh, delivering bulk carrots, potatoes, tomatoes to the two sites in Oban and Dunoon, which they, along with our staff, were packing it into thousands of parcels and getting them out to people that were having to stay at home shielding and just, you know, it, it, it really did work very well. Um, the key tip was we found was to try and use other Scottish suppliers. The supply, supply chain was very limited during these months. Um, a lot of our suppliers in the fruit market in Glasgow were able to help with getting bulk carrots and potatoes uh, and Graham's dairy uh, were used for the milk and the butter. They were really helpful uh, in getting that to us so quickly. Um, and we also managed to link up with a farm in Perthshire uh, with Light Ketty, um, which were really nice strawberries. Uh, but we only got them every second week. They were a treat, the strawberries and the cream. Uh, but it was it was great to get all these things going. And it was great to use other businesses across Scotland at the time rather than looking further abroad to produce abroad. It was great to use sort of local homegrown stuff. Uh, and you can see a wee fruit basket in the slide there with a uh, the sign of how life is now. Hand, hand sanitizer on the strawberries. Two, two things you want in life at the moment. <laughs> but yeah, it was a very difficult period uh, for all the hospitality sector, uh, especially the supply chain that we're involved with. I mean, it's almost gone full circle now with uh, lockdowns in Glasgow and stuff again. And it's uh, it's very hard times. Uh, we can only think, hope that things improve for everyone soon. Uh, but it's good that we've got the local authority contracts to keep us going in the meantime. Me. Thanks very much. Scott. Well, you couldn't, have, you couldn't have worded that better talking about how things have gone full circle because my next slide actually is showing some of the circular approach in action. And, mm -hmm. and for me, this is how it worked both during the pandemic and really on an ongoing basis. You know, the public sector wanted to purchase local food. We wanted that local food to be prepared and available in local towns. We wanted to send it to doorsteps in those same communities or reaching those in the communities normally via school meals or care homes or hospitals. That in turn keeps people in employment in those communities so that they can provide the good quality food that the public sector wants to purchase, enabling the pu public sector to purchase it. So for me, it's dead, dead simple. There's nothing really complex about this. It's just getting into it and penetrating the market. That's the main thing. During the pandemic, we also had a look out for other businesses that we could support under our food for our girl from our girl approach. So a couple of businesses that were um, inadvertently um, affected by the pandemic. We had a biscuit manufacturer in the Isle of Mull and their market had changed completely. So we purchased those and used them in our food parcels too. Um, and there's also a local soap and skincare business and we purchased their soap and shower gel and used them in our food parcels. So it was good stuff and it was about trying to make our people feel valued in our communities and, and using that local supply chain really helps to, to deliver that. So before I wrap up, there are two issues that are whole topics in and of themselves that I would be remiss not to mention, as for me, they are good reasons why local food is also so important at this moment in time. The first, of course, is EU exit. Now, we know there is a great deal of uncertainty around this and we still don't know what kind of deal we're going to end up having. But local suppliers are absolutely showing their resilience, particularly as we emerge from one difficult situation into another. I think that helps to make our food chains much more resilient. We know that there is likely to be price volatility, but again, if you're talking about homegrown produce, that makes it a bit easier for us all to manage. And then the other part of that, of course, is potential supply shortages. However, we do expect less impact where food is locally grown or produced and less dependent on that international wholesaler supply. So there are good reasons why we, um, we feel slightly better positioned than others around this. And the second, of course, is the climate change emergency. We are looking to reduce food miles. We're looking to reduce food waste and our relationships help to tackle that. We'd like to see circular economies and seasonal supply that's matched in menus. And me, I see local food as a, as a means of delivering that. So I hope that has given everyone a wee flavour of what I see is how local authorities can reduce barriers to better partnerships. And I hope you can see that Scott, um, I think, particularly values the relationship that we do have. For me, and I'm sure for you too, Scott, it always comes back to this, getting good quality, locally produced, sustainable food onto plates. And now that we're at the end of November, I don't feel bad about celebrating by showing a photo of Christmas dinner. Um, yeah. And ultimately, that's what it's all about. Happy pupils and happy staff.
the Brussels sprouts are there now. They're in season. Where Good stuff. Yeah, tell all the catering staff, order them up. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, John. Um, and looking forward to talking more as the afternoon goes on. Cheers, thank you. That was great. Thank you so much, Jane and Scott. That was really, really interesting to hear. Um, and we had in the comments, Jane, you are an inspiration. So that's nice to hear as well. Um, so now I'm going to pass on to Lorraine from East Lothian Council, and she'll be chatting as well with Ken from uh, George Anderson and Sons. Are you both there? Yes, I'm oh, here. Perfect. Let me just work the screen. There we go. Um, thanks very much. And I th think I can hear Ken there in the background too. Um, oh. That's OK, you don't need to see me, I don't see think. Before, yeah. <laughs> the less people that see me, the better. Um, I certainly don't have any nice slides, the same as um, Jane and Scott had there. Um, but what I do have is probably the, the kind of same kind of experiences as what Jane's just described. Um, the only thing is I'll probably not put them just quite as eloquently as what she has. Um, she does do a lot more public speaking than I've ever done, um, but I'll try my best anyway. So I'll start off just by explaining a wee bit about kind of where, where we are and what we do kind of thing. I am um, I work in facilities management. We provide the school catering as well as a host of other um, cleaning, caretaking and janitorial services to East Lothian Council. Um, we're very lucky in East Lothian that we do have a lot of growers locally um, and we have held the um, Soil Association's Food for Life Bronze Award since 2013, um, meaning that we've consistently provided sustainable food on our primary school menus. Um, we last year were working very hardly, uh, very quickly and hard towards um, gaining the silver award. But like the rest of you and the rest of the world, COVID hit and our priorities had to change really quickly um, into business critical and just getting food out to the people that were absolutely desperately in need for it when schools closed. Um, what I will say is a huge part of us being able to achieve and maintain the bronze award is down to the hard work of our local distributor of fruit and vegetables, George Anderson's, which Ken um, is, is from, and he'll speak just in a wee while um, about his point of view. Um, as our sole supplier of fresh fruit and vegetables, Ken and his colleagues continually work on our behalf, sourcing produce as local as possible. Um, and an added bonus for us is that they too are based in, in East Lothian, so we're also supporting a local employer. Um, for many years, um, we had a joint contract with some of our neighbouring local authorities. Um, uh, however, when the tendering time came round for that again, the, the host local authority was unable to provide the service and the rest of the, the local authorities, none of us really had the resource to be able to take it forward on behalf of the others either. Um, luckily, at the same time, Scotland Excel we're working on a national framework and when our contract, um, our local agreement contract came to an end, we were able to call off the new framework. Um, at the time, I was really concerned that using a national framework might prevent me um, from getting the local produce that we had always been used to. Um, however, I'm delighted to say that we were able to continue to work with Ken and the team at George Anderson's. Um, as a local authority customer, it can be difficult and frustrating when we're unable to use a local supplier um, who has gone through the tendering process. Quite often it is down to price. Um, so much of what we do is driven by the shrinking budgets that, that we all face. Um, and I don't want to put any potential suppliers off because, you know, we're not looking for things for nothing. We do wish to pay for them and pay a fair price. Um, but unfortunately, there's been situations in the past where we've been unable to use a local company um, just because of price differential. And I, I'm talking tens of thousands of pounds. Um, so that, that, that tugs at my heartstrings because I just feel that, you know, when they're there, they're on their doorstep, you know, trying to use, I think, ways 
and you know listening to Jane there they they really have some good examples of of how we can do that um and I'll, I'll definitely be speaking to her more about how we can we can look at that more in the future and and try to use more local suppliers again um the if I could give any advice um, to suppliers that are perhaps listening today that are looking to provide local authorities um, and they're unsure of the process or, you know, perhaps they think that they're too small, um, it, it would definitely be to work collaboratively with other suppliers, join forces or, you know, approach distributors as well um, to see if you can get your product in. And I mean, the, I think um, Sarah touched on it earlier as well in her introduction that, you know, that the local government procurement process, it, it can be complicated and it can be difficult. Um, but Scott absolutely would be there to offer advice um, and, and, you know, Ask, ask the councils as well. What is it that you are wanting to see? How how can we we get there? And and I do think that you know this is a, a great stepping stone to start those conversations and to see how we all can work closer together. Um, at East Lothian Council, um, we we simply don't have the resource to work individually with you know every grower or every supplier. Um, but engaging with Ken and the team at George Anderson's and, and explaining what our needs are, which basically is we want produce to be as local as possible at a price that we can afford. Um, he then works tirelessly on our behalf, sourcing the finest local quality um, that fits in with the budgets and automatically switches to East Lothian or Scottish produce when it's available. Um, I mean, we we really couldn't continue and progress with um, Food for Life without a supplier like George Anderson's. Um, and I'll now pass you over to Ken, who will give you the supplier's point of view of what we like to work with and, and hopefully um, it'll all be good news as well. Thank you. Of course, of course. Yeah, gosh, that was some introduc um, introduction there. Um, where to start? Well, it's really good to see that the guys through in the West Coast are really playing the same game as we are. It's, it's incredible that you're actually doing the same things through there. I had no idea it was exactly the same. Uh, Scott at Breckenridge is uh, taking the words out of my mouth before I had a chance to say them, because we're doing pretty much the same thing here. We uh, would say that we're, we're currently doing five local authorities in East uh, Central Scotland. and. Our default position is always to buy local produce whenever it's available. And we're always looking for new local suppliers to give us these products. We're based, we're, we're fruit and veg wholesalers, but we do other things as well. So we do dairy as well. We don't do dairy for Scotland XL, but we do bakery for Scotland XL and we do fresh fruit and vegetables. Um, Scotland XL is well worth the effort. It can be challenging to get in there, but once you know you start the process, it definitely is well worth the effort to be involved uh, along with Scotland XL. They're great. Um, let's see, we're doing five local authorities now, um, and the, we really appreciate the, the support and the, the regular business, the day to day, that gives us the base where we can do the same as Scott's doing in the West. That you can go out to the hotels and restaurants. Uh, you're in the same area anyway. You can offer better prices. It's 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 a great way of working. It really is. Um, Lorraine was talking about uh, Brexit and uh, Edo. Oh, sorry, that was Jane, wasn't it? Um, saying that it's really good to have as much local produce as possible. And I did a few bit of number crunching there. And uh, East Lothian Council this year, fifty percent of fifty six percent of the produce that they bought from us is UK based, with forty five percent of that being Scottish, uh, which is Pretty incredible, really. And uh, obviously, you, you kind of get local pineapples and you, you kind of get local bananas. But after that, you know, why would you be buying things outside Scotland if you can get them inside Scotland? This, this is our, like I say, that's our default position. Uh, and we really work well with our local uh, growers. Uh, we support them as well. We take their excess produce to market in Gateshead. Not they've got too much that they can't sell locally, we'll take it to a new market for them. Um, and that helps them as well. And it 
helps us too because it gives a, a good working relationship, which is kind of what it all comes down to. It's partnerships and relationships. If everybody talks to each other, then we can all work together. Uh, people ask us for things, we'll go, yeah, we'll see if we can find that for you. And off we go. There's a, a new one on the go at the moment because there's new regulations for uh, dairy, dairy sweets in primary schools coming in. And I believe there's a bit of a problem finding these products. So we're we're on the hunt to see if we can find uh, somebody that can fill that. And, uh, well, maybe, maybe the guys at Campbell Time Creamery could move into yogurts or something like that. And uh, they could get a, a, a bit of business out of that. I don't know. That's what we're looking at at this side anyway, to see if we can find something uh, to work with there. Uh, and that is kind of our story. It's not rocket science. It's easy stuff. Uh, it can get very difficult and complicated sometimes, but when it comes right down to it, we're just buying, storing, distributing fresh produce to the local authorities, uh, and most of all, just listening to what they're asking for and making sure we're providing it. And that's that's kind of the start and finish of the job, you know. That was great. Thank you so much, Ken. And thank you, Lorraine. And um, that was so nice to hear from you. And, you know, just what you said there, Ken, you know, if you can buy it from Scotland, why would you not? You know, why would you be buying it from abroad? And, you know, that that's exactly what we think. And that's our focus with, with our work um, here. We would never so, compromise quality, though. Uh, exactly. That, that, but to have said that, you generally find that local stuff's better anyway. It's better, yeah. especially it tastes better. Definitely. So, yeah, it's win-win for everybody, you know. Yeah, great. Well, now um, we're going to move on to a session with Gillian Cameron from the Supplier Development Programme. Gillian, if you are there, hopefully. Hi. So Gillian's going to share some, uh, some top tips for suppliers about entering public procurement and tell you a bit more about um, her work at the Supplier Development Programme. Um, I'm going to have to get permission from you, Lucy, so I can oh, share right, my okay. screen. <laughs> Nothing's come up. So I did have something earlier that said um, that I could access it, but it's gone now. <laughs> okay. Can you grant me permission to share my screen? You should have it now. Okay. Oh. Can you see that yet? Um, I don't know why it won't let me share that screen. Can you see that screen yet? Not yet. Okay. Sorry, everyone, just bear with us. That working now? Uh, yes, that's right. Now we now we can see your screen. Okay. Yep. Ah, right. perfect. Yes, is that okay. Uh, yeah. You just need to make it full slideshow. Sure. Uh, yeah, okay. that's perfect. All right, we okay now. Great. Yeah. Good. Thank okay. you. Uh, well, thanks very much, Lucy, for inviting me to speak today. Um. I am from the Supplier Development Programme and I'm going to explain a wee bit about what we do, how we can help your businesses um, and hopefully answer any questions you have. So for those of you that aren't already aware of us, the Supplier Development Programme is a business initiative which is supported by all 32 local authorities and Scottish Government. And the aim of our programme is to ensure that Scottish SMEs and third sector and supported businesses have access to free procurement advice training and ensure they can find, win and keep government contracts. Um, so we have, as I said earlier, 32 local authorities are members of us and we work very closely with them. Currently we have over 17,000 businesses registered on our database and we work with a number of other government bodies as well who are members of us and we do have a programme for corporate members to include some of the supply chain contractors that are out there who want to engage with local SMEs um, open up their supply chain, engage with us and select the electrical contracting authority um, is also part of our membership. So why are we doing this? Well, it was born out of an initiative that came out of the Scottish Government, <clears throat> though the programme had already been running at local uh, authority level in the first place. 
Um, and one of the key focuses for us is about raising awareness of opportunities coming from public sector spend. Um, and we provide training that covers all aspects of tendering. And I'll go on to explain a wee bit more about that in my presentation. Um, a key goal of the Supplier Development Programme is to improve the tender readiness of local suppliers. Um, we firmly believe that having that skill and being prepared in advance um, gives suppliers a head start in the tendering process. Um, we link and promote with other government business initiatives. Um, we speak with the Soil Association, as you see, um, and various other government departments as well. Um, and we're very um, aware of the kind of major infrastructure and spend projects that are coming out of government where there might be opportunities for SMEs to get involved in the supply chain and subcontract opportunities. And overall in Scotland, um, public sector spend is worth around £11 billion. Um, so it's a great opportunity for SMEs to get involved. So what can STP do for you? Um, well, we have a website, stpscotland.co.uk, where you can register for free. Um, you can access then some of our online learning materials. We have a lot of information about the events we're running, the training we're running. Um, we have great guidance, things like procurement jargon buster, because procurement process is full of jargon. Um, we have contacts for each of your region. So when you sign up with the programme, um, you're automatically uh, connected with your local authority area and you can see a point of contact there. Um, they may be in procurement, it might be in economic development. And we also have links to Business Gateway as well. Um, so you'll be able to find some regional and local information. Um, we have a supplier register. So when you sign up with the programme, um, you can also fill out a supplier profile and um, tell us a bit about who you are. But the other members can have a look through that if they're looking for particular suppliers in a particular area. They can use our database to identify um, suppliers if they're wishing to get in contact with them about particular opportunities. We have a news feed and a newsletter which comes out once a month, which will keep you up to date um, with the projects we're working on, the training that we're undertaking um, and any new initiatives that are maybe coming out of government that are relevant to suppliers. Um, we link in with Public Contracts Scotland. Um, in fact, one of our most popular courses is how to use Public Contracts Scotland and I'll explain a wee bit more about that as we go through. So our training, um, Historically, um, we have training over three levels. Um, we did regional face-to-face -face workshops, which currently, due to COVID, um, is all being run by webinar. And we found that highly successful. I think the move to online technology has been um, amazing over the last six to eight months. Um, I would say previously, more people were keen to attend the face-to-face -face workshops um, and webinars were the sort of other aspect of tra attending training. Um, but obviously COVID has changed that perspective and we've still seen really good turnout at the events that we're doing via webinar. Um, we also run industry specific workshops um, on particular topics. It might be about sustainability, it might be about food procurement, it might be about um, Zero Waste Scotland and we partner with a number of organisations to run those too. And policy workshops fall into that category too. Um, some of you, or I hope many of you, might have been along to one of our Meet the Buyer days. Um, we do an annual Meet the Buyer, which is a national event. We also do a Meet the Buyer North, which connects suppliers and buyers in the north of Scotland. Um, and we also do regional Meet the Buyers. So we have a few of them in the pipeline. Uh, last month we had the Fife Meet the Buyer, which gives small businesses an, an opportunity to come along and meet with the actual buying organisation to meet the category managers, to meet the different people that are involved in the procurement um, and find out what opportunities are coming up. So a really useful networking way to get involved and find out what's happening in your local authority. Um, we run partner and business support events. So again, if they're wanting to showcase a particular contract opportunity coming up um, or maybe they've got some initiatives they're wanting to highlight, for instance, around community benefits, um, certainly we will help deliver on that. And key to all of this is giving you access to the buyers um, and economic development staff that are working at the councils. Um, so really good opportunities for you to come along and ask questions, albeit virtual at the moment. A growing area for Supplier Development Programme has been our early intervention and our line training. Um, we worked tirelessly last year on various contracts where it was recognised that in advance it would be helpful to help the marketplace understand what tenders were coming up and what the opportunity was actually about and to make sure they had the skills to bid for that opportunity. 
Um, we actually won an award, in fact, won two awards this year, the Government Opportunity Awards, um, partnering with Scottish Borders Council and also North Lanarkshire Council, um, highlighting the benefits of doing a line tender training, whereby there was opportunities in advance. Um, one of the sectors we actually worked on was for the 1140 hours, which is about childcare and nursery provision. Um, and it's really useful for suppliers to understand um, what the opportunity is about, what sort of questions they might get asked, and for us to help upskill them um, in the tender process so they can get involved in that. So this is, I know, a very, very busy slide, but um, this is the different courses that we have and all this information is available on our website. So there's something for everyone. So if you've never been involved in public sector tendering, then we have an introductory model and then you can move on to the level one, level two and level three, depending on what tendering experience you have. Um, as I said earlier, our Using Public Contracts Scotland is one of the most um, well attended courses that we have and it really takes you through how best to do that. And what I'm going to talk about in my presentation today is a bit more about how you can get the best out of using Public Contract Scotland to identify opportunities. So I, I didn't want to just rely on the internet today, so I'm afraid I've just got screenshots here, um, but hopefully you'll get the gist of what we're trying to do. Uh, and I hope all the suppliers that are on today are already registered with Public Contract Scotland, which is the main advertising portal for contract opportunities in Scotland. So this is the home page here and you can click on the button that says search for suppliers and um, you can also search for buyers on the website as well but we'll go through the journey of looking for contracts so it opens up a, an easy search frame and um, where you can actually put in a keyword uh, such as food or you can also use the categories which there's a category for food and beverages um, and then you can search on that and that will bring up any matching opportunities um, to that search Uh, you can also look for, and I think it's quite beneficial for people to look for um, under the notice type, is um, contract results, which is the contract awards. So perhaps you're a smaller supplier and you're not actually going to bid for the main contract, but you might be interested to work in the supply chain and work with one of the other contractors that's already won the contract. So I think it's quite useful to understand who's won the contract. And by using the contract results filter, you can see what contracts awards are out there um, for your category um, and you can see from the screenshot here there's a couple that I've just found that were for Scottish Borders Council and for North Ayrshire Council. So again you may wish to look at that notice, understand what the requirements were, who it's been awarded to and get in touch with them and find out if there is any opportunities for you to work together. The other way you can identify opportunities is going through and searching for buyers. Um, so under the buying organisation, you could just put in the council, for instance, a Gallon Butte Council. Um, but you can also look at sectors. Um, I think too for the food industry, and uh, things like the NHS or higher education is a good sector to look at because they're particularly going to be buying food. Um, so again, you can use the sector filter to identify all the different um, sectors. And I did say all the hospitals in Scotland. And you could narrow your search down using the postcode filter as well. So if you only wanted to look at uh, health uh, organisations in the Glasgow area, for instance, you could do that. Once you've identified uh, the buyer that you're interested in, when you click into the details, you get a selection of tabs here that gives you a lot of information. I always say to suppliers that Public Contract Scotland is a great way to do some homework and to understand your marketplace, to look for particular buyers you want to work with. So by looking at the buyer details, um, you'll get the contact details for that organisation and then you can look at the different things that they've done. So you can see what contract notices they've put out, what they have currently. You can look at their contract award notices and um, you can access their contract register where it's connected online. And you can also look at how many quick quotes are putting out through the statistics tab. So again, I think that's worthwhile doing a bit of homework and um, if there's particular organisations you want to work with to see what they're already buying. Another area that I find is often unknown is the um, list of frameworks. So when you go into the information section in Public Contract Scotland, there's an area called the forward plan. And the forward plan is an Excel spreadsheet that's uploaded every month that has all the different framework contracts in Scotland. 
So these are contracts where they've already been tendered and there's a list of operators that are on that framework who then they'll call off from when they wish to buy. And you heard a wee bit from Scotland Excel earlier on. So on this uh, forward plan, you'll find there's a list of contracts for Scottish Government, Scotland Excel, the NHS and also higher education. So again, I think that's a really useful piece of information to understand what contracts are out there. You're able to see when they're going to renew, if they've been extended, who the contractors are, um, and there's a wealth of information in that. So if you're registered in a Public Contract Scotland, um, make sure you filled out your supplier finder profile. Uh, for buyers who are going to do some low value procurements, they might invite you to what's called a quick quote. Um, but in order to be invited, you have to be on Public Contract Scotland and you have to have published your supplier finder profile. So when you register with Public Contract Scotland, um, you can then log in and start to fill out that profile. Uh, and one of the key things that I have to always push with suppliers is that there's two buttons on here and you'll see I've ringed them in red about the profile status. So automatically your profile is defaulted to unpublished and um, you must then make it uh, public by hitting the publish button. If you don't do that, then your company won't be seen by buyers. So if they go into search for suppliers, and if they're looking for particular suppliers that can find certain categories or food, etc., they won't be able to find you unless you've published your profile. So that's a really important top tip to make sure that you have gone in and published your profile. So if you haven't already done so, I would strongly recommend that you go back and check and make sure that's happened. Within your profile, you can put in a company description. Again, very important. Maybe have a look at some of the notices that are already out there. See how buyers are describing contracts. What's the language they're using? What they're looking for to make sure you've got the right information in there that's going to grab their attention of what you can do. You can enter up to six keywords. So again, with that hat on, think about how a buyer is looking for, what they're looking for. Is it cheese? Is it, you know, what particular commodity are they wanting to find? Um, and make sure your keywords represent that. The other thing I suggest is there's a button here for am I an SME? Councils are very keen to ensure that they are working with SMEs, so it's important if you are an SME to make sure you've denoted yourself as such. Um, and again, there's a little button you can toggle for that to say that you are an SME. So just some more general information about getting tender ready. Um, use PCS to research your buying organisations, find out about supply opportunities and subcontractor opportunities. Um, check the details of past contracts. You could go in and look at some of the historic data. What have they put out to tender before? Um, you could then use that perhaps to connect with the buyer, find out when they're going to relet that contract. Is it going to be the same as last time? Is, are they going to change it? Is there something they're looking for? Um, is there a way they wish to improve it? Is there something different they could do? Is there something more that you could offer them? Consider your training requirements. As I say, we offer free tra tender training, and um, so you can attend our courses at any time. Um, so make sure again that you've put that into your diary. And there are half day sessions, and the webinars tend to run for maybe one to two hours. Um, and we also do sessions that are about the buying organisations. So for instance, if you want to find out how to work with a certain council, and um, you'll see some of those up on our website. Also consider what training you might need for other qualifications such as maybe hygiene and safety. Understand the requirements in the tender and the timeline. So again, using the data that's in Public Contract Scotland, start to plan when you think contracts are going to come out and work back from that. So you can make sure that you're going to be ready for that opportunity coming out. So it's worthwhile looking at those dates and maybe having a, a calendar um, of renewal dates for contracts. Um, you might have passed by an opportunity. It might be that the Scotland Excel contract is coming up again. You want to bid for it the next time. So make sure you're aware when that's happening. I think it's useful to have a tender library and prepare the information you'd likely to be requested in a tender and your case studies. Uh, you can highlight the good work you've already been doing. If you've got references or perhaps you've won awards for your food, again, it's always handy to have them to refer to in your bid. Do you have a bid strategy? Um, how are you going to go about tendering? How are you going to decide which opportunities are for you? Um, STP have some guidance on their website, so it's useful to go and read some of our documentation. It talks about bid strategy, talks about how to approach that. 
and any documentation certificates. If you need to have any standards, if you need to have any safety certificates, make sure you have them in a handy place so that when you're going to bid, you have them ready to upload into the tender box. So just some final hints and tips. Read and reread the question. I think that's one of the number one issues that buyers come back to us and say that the supplier maybe just didn't read the tender and didn't understand what was being asked of them. And I always say to suppliers that if you're not sure what's being asked of you, make sure you clarify. Um, don't presume that the tender documentation is correct. If you've got any concerns, go back and ask. And sometimes you'll open up the, the post box and you'll see there's six tender documents and there's maybe only five attachments. So go back and question if they don't add up or if you're not sure what's been asked. You can see all the different questions that have been asked and they will be in the Q&A section online. So you can always check that and see if somebody else has already asked the question and because they will publish back uh, that reply to everyone so you can have access to that. Um, use our procurement guide. Um, I can give you the link for that. It's online. It's very informative. It lets you think about how you're going to um, promote yourself or when you're going to bid for contracts. Um, your approach to quality. What quality level are they asking for in the specification? Make sure you can meet that. And again, your pricing strategy, that's very important. What, what's your price point for your contract? I think the last two are probably the most important points, time. Allow plenty of time for your bids. Don't leave it the last minute. Um, everything's done electronically now, so you want to make sure that you have enough time, that your internet doesn't go down, that the website you're using doesn't go down, um, and that you have all your information ready. So I strongly recommend you don't leave it to the last minute, you know, one minute to 12 on a Friday afternoon when the, the bid has to be in. And make sure you complete the process. Um, we ourselves run tenders and there's been times where somebody hasn't actually uploaded all the correct documents and they haven't then pr pressed submit. So make sure that you've gone right through that process and that your documents are lodged online for when you're doing your tender. So that was a bit of a whistle stop tour of STP. I know we didn't have very long today, but I hope that's been helpful and I hope you're able to access um, the information that I've got here. I'm happy to share the slides and I'm happy to take any questions around that. Thank you so much for that, Gillian. And I know you had so much information and I didn't give you much time, but you did a wonderful job um, and so many useful tips in there. And also, um, as Gillian said, SDP run a lot of other events that um, can give you a deeper dive into public procurement that should be helpful. Um, so I'm just going to have a look here, a couple of the questions that came through um, in the chat. And if you have more questions, please, um, please do add them as we go along. Um, so we had a question here from Gordon about school menus and are they in line with what is in season? Um, so I think maybe Jane and Lorraine, you would be best placed to answer this if you don't mind. Yeah, I don't mind coming in and answering that. Um, short answer is is yes. Um, speaking from our girl and Butte's perspective, we do two menu changes a year, um, one in spring, summer and one for autumn, winter, and it is to allow for that seasonality. Um, what we try to do, though, in our menu as well, is we're not too prescriptive about some of the seasonality so that we've got a wee bit of flexibility there. So a couple of years ago, we removed the actual specific at veg, for instance, of the, the, the main uh, um, main menu to allow the seasonal aspect to be built into it. And that means that we can then go to Scott and say, right, what's in season? What can you get a hold of? What can we afford? Uh, and, and we can change it on the basis of what's what's there. And um, so it might be spring cabbage in the, the summer and uh, or in the spring. Um, it might be asparagus or it might be carrots in the winter or turnip. So, yeah, very much uh, around seasonality for us. I would absolutely just agree with what Jane's saying. We currently have two menus as well in East Lothian. Um, and I mean, I'm sure that local authorities that don't have a Soil Association Award, they probably do two menus as well, um, because although they might not have the accreditation, a lot of them follow quite closely to what, what goes on. So, yep, definitely seasonal. Great, thanks for that. Um, and we had another question from Gordon and Adam also um, 
came on to say that he would like to echo what Gordon was saying. And um, so the question was around being a small producer um, and would uh, they would like to collaborate with wholesalers to get products to local authority um, customers. So this is a really good point, actually. If you only produce one product or a small collection of products and you would like to get through to a wholesaler like Breckenridge or like George Anderson and Sons, um, how can they do that? And how could suppliers currently being used uh, be made transparent um, so that they can find out who's got the contract. I think Sam did give um, an answer here, which was really helpful. I don't know if you want to come online, Sam, um, and chat a bit more about that, or if anyone else has any um, kind of tips of how smaller pro uh, producers could get um, in with wholesalers. I can obviously, obviously speak from Scotland XL's perspective, um, but what we're trying to do with a lot of our frameworks is start to have a supply only option um, in our frameworks, which means that we can then start linking smaller suppliers with distributors so that we can start getting more local supply into the councils. Um, all of our opportunities are on PCS, but also if you go onto our website, we do have a contracts register which shows all the suppliers that we do have on our frameworks. Um, so all that information can be found there. And I believe the councils do something similar with their contracts registers as well, but Jane might be able to correct me if I'm wrong there. Yeah, no, I would agree with what, with what you've said. That's about right, Sam. I think that's, that's um, yeah, absolutely accurate. I think I would also go back to what I was saying about our Campbell and Cheese and how successful that was. And that didn't come about by going through any traditional routes to market through wholesale. Um, it was really done through First Milk saying, listen, we've got this cracking product and we think it would go well. And, and it did, and it was fantastic. And sometimes it's OK to look at things independently. Sometimes it's OK if it's a really good local product to make sure that we're getting it in, into the public sector food chain because it's about doing that right thing and what's right for the communities and for our businesses. So um, that we can always um, adapt things and use a little bit of creativity at times without breaking any rules and regulations, of course. But there's ways and means of doing it. Exactly. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, yeah, I would say, you know, just echoing what Jane said there is, you know, knock on the door, ask someone, ask your local authority or ask us. Um, you know, this is my role within Food for Life Scotland is to support suppliers and producers and local authorities across Scotland. So if you have any questions or even if it's just, you know, you have an idea you want to explore, you can always contact me and I will get you in touch with the right people or discuss it further with you. So yeah, let, let me know. Um, and then we have another question here from Fiona. Um, what's the one action that you would recommend small producers take after today? So who's going to take that? Any, uh, anyone? Jane, you look like you're just about to pop in uh, something. You know me, I'll have a pop in anything. Uh, Fiona, great question, because it is about how do we take the small steps to make this happen? Because uh, without putting words in any of the, 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 the people here today's mouths, it can be pretty overwhelming when you look at the figures and the numbers and the sheer scale. Um, so start small, uh, pick up the phone to, to find out who your contacts are in your local council if you don't already know, or, or pick up the phone to, to Lucy and the team at Soil Association. Visit the council website to see if you can get a bit more of a feel as to um, what they do around uh, food and drink, or if you have um, any engagement through the economic development team. That's always a way in as well. Speak to them because I know lots of people may be speaking to one part of the council, but aren't always necessarily aware of how that's joined up elsewhere. Um, I think that's a gap for a number of local authorities, including my own. We need to be better at, at how we tackle um, uh, fruit, food and drink um, policy and strategy across the board. And, and I'm smiling that it's, it's Fiona who's asked that question because we were talking about that very thing last week. Um, so we're not all perfect, but what I would say is start small, speak to people you already know or um, just visit websites. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, so I think we will come to a close there. Anna, do you have the final slide for me? That's great. 
So I just want to say a huge thank you um, to all of our speakers today and to everyone that came along. Um, I hope that you found that useful. Um, I loved hearing from all, uh, all of our speakers. We're all, you know, we're all aiming for the same thing. Um, and so when we can work together, that, that's the perfect, uh, that's the perfect option really. Um, so you, next we're having a, a networking session. So this is just a really informal session for, for um, some smaller breakout room conversations. So Anna will have sent you an email. You should have that email now in your inbox um, and you can click on the link there, which will take you to a smaller group meeting. If you don't have the email or you have issues um, connecting with that, then do let us know. We'll still be here in this meeting as well. And um, so we can hopefully uh, help you with that. Um, if you would like anyone's details after the meeting, let me know, my email address is there, let me know and I can try and connect you. Um, obviously I can't just share everyone's details because of GDPR, but I will happily um, connect people after this um, on an individual basis. And also I'll be sending you up uh, a follow-up email after this, um, which will just have some information. I'll put in the links from the speakers and um, an evaluation survey from us just to find, uh, find out how you found the session, because that can help advise further sessions. Um, and also the Scottish Government are doing a supplier survey at the moment on public procurement um, which is a really good opportunity for you to have your voices heard from Scottish Government so I'll put that link in the follow-up email as well um, but other than that thank you everyone thank you to our speakers and yeah if you head across now to the networking session you should have the link <laughs>